The following is the first of two videos in which David Wood explains his motives for deleting his content from YouTube. Future content of his will be published on his own website, act17.com, and re-uploaded by others to YouTube, including right here on this channel. I will be publishing his old videos one a day, so be sure to subscribe to relive David's amazing career. 668,000 subscribers, 180 million views. Seems like a good time to delete my channel. Would you like to know why and when and what happens next? I started my YouTube channel in 2009 with Nabil Qureshi. We saw the potential of YouTube early on. As far as I know, I was the first Christian apologist to do YouTube full time. There are a bunch now. I spent years telling Christian apologists to get on YouTube, took years to convince some of them. I can no longer tell people to build their ministries or careers around YouTube. I've been making YouTube videos for 13 years and YouTube has gotten worse every single year I've been on the platform. It would be one thing if they had reasonable people enforcing rules. They don't. They've programmed bots to delete videos and channels, and the people who review the appeals are activists who use their positions to decide what they want the world to see. I made a video where I interviewed the friend of a girl who had been murdered by her family in an honor killing. That video was banned for hate speech. I made a video condemning cartoon killings banned for hate speech. I made a video criticizing the British legal system for helping child traffickers, banned for hate speech. I've made several videos criticizing the persecution of Hindus. Those are always fine. I've made several videos criticizing the persecution of Muslims. Those are always fine. But I've been repeatedly banned for posting videos criticizing the persecution of Christians in places like Pakistan. YouTube just doesn't want me talking about it. I've had probably a dozen videos banned for mocking ISIS. YouTube really doesn't like it when you mock ISIS. When people send me death threats and I take screenshots and put them in a video, I get banned for hate speech. Yes, I get banned for talking about threats against me. Meanwhile, if you're a popular YouTuber calling for the public executions of ex-Muslims, you're fine on YouTube. This is a part of our religion. There's a reason to it. Yeah, there's a reason why there's a capital punishment, because people like you, little weaklings who leave their religion and cause uh, corruption in the land by spreading it. The capital punishment in Islamic law would be applied to you. We have no doubt. And we're proud of that. If you're a sheikh, Telling your followers to prepare for the future when they'll go door to door, giving people the option to convert, pay protection money, or be murdered, you're fine on YouTube. Publicly, Islam rules. If they refuse, then we have to fight. And if we fight you, then we capture you, you become our slaves, and we take your land, and you take where... Because you refuse, I give you two good options. Keep in mind, I'm not saying these guys should be banned. I'm simply pointing out the hypocrisy. They can literally call for genocide and YouTube will help them shout their message from the rooftops, the same rooftops they want to throw homosexuals off of. But if I make a video criticizing their calls for violence, I get banned for hate speech. The people who decide what we're allowed to say on YouTube are morally insane. They are absolute lunatics. Now, my friends and I have gotten pretty good over the past year at getting YouTube to overturn bans and restore content. So YouTube gives me a strike. I appeal the strike. YouTube instantly rejects the appeal because they don't actually read them. And a bunch of us complain to Team YouTube on Twitter, and I contact YouTube directly and complain. And YouTube eventually admits that they were wrong for banning my content. But sometimes it takes weeks to get them to fix their mistake. By the time they fix their mistake, I've already served my entire seven-day sentence. These guys are like cops who walk around 
arresting people for no reason and then reluctantly release the people after they've served their entire sentence for completely bogus charges. YouTube has adopted a punish first, ask questions later, guilty until proven innocent policy. So I'm trying to make YouTube videos and YouTube is constantly, relentlessly harassing me and slowing me down. And the random bogus strikes affect your plans. We've been planning for years to do a 50 part apologetics series where I would release one video per week for 50 straight weeks and people from around the world would translate the videos and re-record them in their own languages. What's the main monkey wrench in that plan? Well, I know for a fact that I can't go a month, let alone a year, without being banned for something on this channel. True, we would probably get YouTube to fix their inevitable mistakes, but again, sometimes that takes days or weeks. So it's very difficult to get started on long-term projects when there's no long-term stability. But every time we get YouTube to overturn one of their bogus strikes, I announce, we won again. And then I think to myself, did I really win though? What did I win? I'm just keeping myself embedded in a system that's hostile towards anyone who criticizes honor killings or grooming gangs or pedophiles or terrorists. So why do I think I'm winning when I keep myself under the control of morally insane morons? And when I start thinking about how ridiculous it is to keep myself under their control, I end up taunting them and telling them to shut up and telling them to get it over with and give me even more strikes and just ban me. But they never do ban me. It's like they want to slow me down and harass me as much as possible without actually kicking me off the platform. Why is that? Well, if they kick me off the platform, they no longer control me. YouTube is like the ultimate abusive boyfriend. An abusive boyfriend beats his girlfriend, but he doesn't want her to leave. As soon as she tries to leave, it's, oh, come on, baby. You know I didn't mean it. Come back to me, baby. Abusive boyfriends are obsessed with control. So are abusive platforms. YouTube used to simply connect content creators with the people who wanted to watch their content. Now, YouTube is turning itself into the world's most ridiculous obstacle course. I have to jump through hoops and climb over walls and run across rope bridges to get my videos to my viewers. So why am I still here? Well, that one's easy. I stay on YouTube because in spite of the ridiculous policies and the morally insane idiots who enforce them, this is still the place where people watch my videos. Some of you have been watching my videos for 13 years. I stay on YouTube for you. I put up with total morons banning my videos for the sake of the community that watches my videos. When someone says to a YouTuber, if you have a problem with YouTube, why don't you move to another platform? That's the reason we don't move. If you've built a community on YouTube, moving to another platform means that you're going to lose a lot of that community. You don't want to lose a lot of your community, so you stay on YouTube. Now, YouTube knows that content creators don't want to give up the communities we've been building for years, so YouTube knows that they can get away with harassing and abusing content creators. Beware of manipulators. They'll use your dedication to something good against you. So we put up with YouTube's antics because we don't want to give up the communities we've built. And depending on how much time and effort we've put into building those communities, YouTubers will generally be willing to put up with a lot for our viewers. Like if instead of constantly banning my videos and giving me bogus strikes, YouTube had said, David, if you want to keep your channel, one of our tech nerds is going to randomly show up at your house once per month and punch you in your mouth. I would have taken that deal. Punch me in my mouth. Knock me out. Go to town. Just don't ban my stuff. So if YouTubers are dedicated to the communities we've built, why am I deleting my channel? Well, there are two main issues here. One, since I know that YouTube gets worse every single year, and since I know that the longer I keep this channel, 
the more entrenched and embedded I'll be in this ridiculous system that will eventually ban us, it seems irresponsible not to make some major changes. YouTube has had me at two strikes multiple times, always for complete nonsense. It's always been their mistake. Three strikes, and they delete your channel. I wouldn't even be able to notify my viewers because my only way of communicating with most of them is through YouTube. So constantly fighting to keep my channel instead of rebuilding is stupid in the long run. Two, this is just me personally, but I can no longer justify the amount of time I spend arguing with YouTube in order to keep my channel up. I'm 46 years old. I come from a massively dysfunctional background. There are endless family emergencies. And any time I spend arguing with Susan's activist goons is time I will never get back. One of my brothers has brain damage because of a drug overdose. He's now in a mental hospital because he started having delusions. He keeps thinking everyone is conspiring against him. My other brothers in prison for drugs, child protective services threatened to take all of his future children from him if he didn't sign over custody of his son. So he signed over custody of his son and they gave my nephew to some nice couple. We hired a lawyer to try and get custody ourselves, but it was too late. Everything had been finalized. At home, of course, I have five kids. Two of them are on life support. Ever since COVID hit, it's been really difficult to keep nurses, especially on weekends. We turned part of our downstairs into a mini hospital. We hooked it up. Got a desk, a couch, a TV, a mini fridge. We cover childcare. We give bonuses. We tricked out our wheelchair van. That thing is like Kit from Knight Rider. Talks to you and tells you if something is wrong with your kids. But no matter what we do, steady nursing is basically impossible. I think the main thing that changed is that the nursing agencies now require piles of pointless paperwork. So being a night nurse used to be a pretty cool job because there's only like two, maybe three hours of actual work. The rest of the night, you just have to be there to make sure nothing goes wrong. So you could watch a movie, read, whatever. But now you have hours of completely pointless paperwork to fill out, and people hate wasting time on pointless paperwork. So it's not a cool job anymore. Notice the parallel with YouTube, by the way. Why does it seem like every business is making it harder for people to do their jobs by adding pointless extra work? Nurses have to fill out piles of paperwork. YouTubers have to fight with YouTube to keep our content up. Anyway, the point here is there's always a lot going on in my life. There are always family emergencies. When I'm not making a video, I'm a nurse for my kids. I'll find a way to do stuff that's important. Whatever else is going on, I'll find a way to make videos because I think it's important. But I have a serious problem doing stuff that's a pointless waste of time. And no one makes you waste your time like Susan What's-Her-Face. The time I spend explaining YouTube's community guidelines to YouTube could be spent building something they can't control. So why don't YouTubers do that? Because YouTubers don't realize how much power they really have. YouTubers are the reason YouTube is popular. No one in the history of YouTube ever came to the platform for Susan What's-Her-Face. No one ever came to YouTube for the coders. People come to YouTube for the videos, we make those. We're the ones who made this platform popular and YouTube treats us like garbage. Why don't we leave and go somewhere else? We'll stay in a bad situation for the same reason people always stay in a bad situation. People are scared of the desert. Think about the story of the Exodus. The children of Israel were slaves in Egypt, horribly oppressed. Moses led them out of Egypt. Where did he lead them? Into the desert. And what happened when things started getting rough in the desert? The children of Israel started grumbling and saying, we want to go back to Egypt. Why would they want to go back to slavery? Well, 
People can put up with all kinds of suffering or abuse as long as they're used to it. It's the unknown and unpredictable that freaks them out. The desert is unknown and unpredictable, so they'd rather be slaves because at least they understand it. Fortunately, most things that we have to deal with in the West today aren't nearly as bad as having to meet the daily brick quotas in ancient Egypt. I'm just talking about the principle here. Earlier, I mentioned a woman staying with an abusive boyfriend. It's the same dynamic. Sometimes a woman will stay with an abusive boyfriend because she's more comfortable with an abusive boyfriend than she is being alone. Being alone is the desert for her. Now, if you really like sharing information with people around the world and you start making videos on YouTube, that gets addictive real quick. You make a video and people from dozens of countries watch it overnight. All of a sudden, you have a global community. You start seeing the same people over and over in the comments. You start getting to know them. They become your friends. They become your global family. Every day you post videos for your global family. You're living your dream life. If you love sharing information, what could be better? Then out of nowhere, you get a strike for absolutely nothing. And you get banned for a week, even though you didn't do anything wrong. Then it happens again and again and again. And you realize there are people who control your connection to your global family, and they don't care about you or your global family. These self-declared lords of speech keep threatening to terminate your channel, which would rip you away from your global family. So what do you do? You put up with it. You're not going to leave your global family just because the self-declared lords of speech keep harassing and threatening you. But in your mind, you start wondering, is there a way to stay connected to my global family without being under the control of a bunch of power-tripping, morally insane idiots? Is there a way to keep the fellowship without the censorship? That would be the promised land for a YouTuber. But where's the promised land? It's not one of the other platforms. Your global family isn't there. Where's the promised land? You don't know. But to find it, you have to enter the realm of the unknown, the unfamiliar, the unpredictable. You have to go through the desert. Again, people would rather put up with just about anything than go through the desert. But here's the thing. I was born in the desert. I was raised in the desert. I've always lived in the desert. Growing up, we moved from one trailer to another. I stayed with one relative after another. I was never in one place for more than a year or two. Then it was jail, prison, the Bronx, jihadis swearing by Allah that they're going to kill me, and kids on life support. Do you know what it's like having kids on life support for 15 years? It's like you're constantly balancing on a tightrope. And if you slip, one of your kids dies. The desert isn't weird to me. Normal is weird to me. Some brief period of stability is weird to me. It's like Kevin Costner at the end of that stupid movie, Waterworld. In the future, the ice caps have melted and the entire world is one giant ocean. Kevin Costner spent his entire life in a boat. When he finally gets to land, the top of Mount Everest, he gets land sickness and has to go back to the water. It's too strange here, it doesn't move right. It's only land sickness. When you've been through the West Virginia trailer park system and the jail system and the prison system and you've got terrorists threatening to murder you and your kids are hanging on to life by a thread, it's just hard to be intimidated by some loser pushing a ban button from the comfort of his safe space. I'm just not scared of YouTube and I'm not scared of the desert. So. If someone has to burn his channel to the ground and figure out how to defeat YouTube, 
it might as well be me. To be clear, when I say defeat YouTube, I don't mean that we can somehow crush YouTube. When I delete my channel, YouTube won't even notice that I'm gone. They're too big to care, I'm too small to matter. YouTube is the second most visited site in the world, and it's owned by the first most visited site in the world. There's no stopping YouTube, not without some sort of mass creator exodus. When I talk about defeating YouTube, I mean that YouTube keeps people under their control because we're all convinced that we can't be as effective without being under their control. Anywhere else, we're going to be less effective. That's the thinking that keeps YouTube in control. You defeat YouTube when you figure out how to be more effective at sharing content without being under the control of YouTube. And I think it's pretty straightforward how to put together a more effective system. First, your content needs to be spread out, especially if your content is being targeted by YouTube. If your content isn't being targeted by YouTube, just wait, they'll eventually be coming for you too. But if your content is currently being targeted by YouTube, you can't have one big channel where a random ban paralyzes your output. And you can't have one big YouTube channel with other platforms like Odyssey just as a backup. The vast majority of your viewers will still be focused on your one big channel so YouTube can stop your production anytime they want. If you're posting anything remotely controversial, it needs to be spread across multiple channels and platforms, preferably with different kinds of content in different places, so that people who are interested in that kind of content can follow you there. This way, if a platform gives you some bogus strike and suspends you for a week, they've only temporarily paused one small part of what you do. The rest keeps moving, and so nothing ever slows you down. Second, if your content is spread across multiple channels and multiple platforms, your viewers need to know where to find what they're looking for. So you need your own way of communicating with them. If you have one big channel on YouTube, YouTube can shut down your communication with your community when they ban you for something. So you need a way to communicate with your community that's not under the control of YouTube. Third, you need some sort of central hub, or more than one central hub, where you can't be banned. And everyone needs to know that they can find you there if you get suspended or banned somewhere else. In other words, you cover one broad topic over here on this channel, and another broad topic over there on that channel, and another topic over on this other platform, but everything is available on your main hub. And your viewers know where to find you if you suddenly turn up on a YouTube milk carton. Fourth, you have to reverse the power flow. YouTube is a giant parasite, sucking the blood out of creators. Creators are the ones who bring people to the platform. YouTube feeds off of the popularity of the people who make the videos. So PewDiePie is like a shark, and YouTube is like a lamprey stuck to the side of PewDiePie. Imagine a giant, multi-headed mutant lamprey that's so effective at sucking the blood out of sharks that it now weighs 10 million tons and has its teeth stuck in millions of different sharks. That's YouTube. If you want to defeat YouTube, you have to reverse the power flow. You have to make it so that the things you control are feeding off of YouTube and other platforms so that the things you control are constantly growing and getting stronger. In other words, the shark suddenly sees the giant multi-headed mutant lamprey and uses the lamprey as its new food source. So if you're like me and you have one big channel, one main way to stay connected to your community, and YouTube can nuke you at any time, you're being stupid, like I've been for several years, because I could see this coming. But you can be more effective and reach more people and be uncancelable if you demolish the old YouTube-controlled structure and build a new structure. And so I'll be deleting my channel next month. Why next month? Because that's when everything should be up and running. 
I don't know what will work best as a central hub, but we're about to have our own video platform just for Christian apologetics content. Defenders Media has built a platform where my videos can't be banned unless I post something illegal. All of my content that's currently here will be there. That platform launches next week. Later in June, my new website and community app will launch. These are also set up to host content. They're owned by me, so they're uncancelable. And I've been assured that even in the event of massive site-wide destruction by hackers, everything will be restored in about 20 minutes. These will be the central hubs of my media network. Then I just have to crank out content for various channels and platforms. Since we won't be in constant danger of being canceled, I'm scheduled to record the entire 50-part Apologetics Empire series in a studio next month. So get ready, translators. After that, Brother Rashid and I are going in on our own studio. We just need to agree on a location. There are several good locations where we can get a two-room studio, but we'd rather have a place where we can expand as needed, and that's a bit trickier. As soon as we agree on a spot, Robert Spencer has already agreed to join us for shows. One very important part of all of this is that I need a full-time videographer and editor, so let me know if you'd like to apply. Over the past several weeks, I've experimented with running ads in select videos. I wanted to see if by running ads, I could earn enough to hire someone to work for me full-time. I've long believed that roughly half of what I do to make my videos could be done by someone else, probably even better. So when it comes to the content of my videos, the points I'm making, I don't want anyone touching that. But when it comes to setting up and recording and making graphics and editing and posting and making thumbnails, those are things that someone else could do. And if someone else were doing those things, I would have twice as much time to focus on content, which would really help if I want to produce unique content for multiple channels and platforms. And I found out that, yes, if I run one or two ads per week in my videos, I can hire a full-time videographer and editor. I know plenty of people who can edit for me from a distance if I send them files, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone with the relevant skills who moves here, shows up, sets up, records me, then goes and edits while I get started on the content for the next video. If that sounds like something you'd like to do, let me know because I have some questions for you. Now, costs are adding up quickly to cover some of the parts of this new network. If I want my entire library of videos under our control and unbannable, I do have to cover the costs of hosting. The estimate I was given to start is around $400 per month because I have a ton of videos. That goes down over time because once everything is up and running, we'll eventually have ads for Christian companies and that will offset the costs. But now when we're at the startup level, it's about $400 per month. I just like to pay for an entire year in advance because I'm about to have a lot of other things to focus on. Then there's the website and app. The guy who owned act17.com held on to it for more than a decade. He knew I wanted it. He wasn't giving it up cheap. I kept holding out to see if he would drop the price. He never dropped the price. He only raised the price. Smart man. So I finally coughed up the money for act17.com. That's paid for. But now a team is working on building the website and community app. It's about $2,200 to get everything up and running. So doing a quick fundraiser for the $4,800 for hosting and the $2,200 for the website and app. If you'd like to chip in to help get this media empire started, the link to the fundraiser is in the description box. Some of you are always a little nervous about change. You may be thinking when I say all of this, but why delete your channel? Why don't you just leave this channel up while you start building your network? What can I say? I'm just a bridge burning kind of guy. Do you understand the idea of burning a bridge? A general burns the bridge behind him so that everyone knows the only way to go is forward. 
And the only way to survive is total victory. Apart from that, there's no way to just let this channel sit. This channel only exists right now because we're constantly fighting YouTube to fix their bogus strikes. The YouTube censors are like time vampires, sucking every bit of time you have and wasting it. Better to get it over with and stop wasting time. Videos that are still good can be reposted. In fact, feel free to download and repost any of my videos. Keep in mind, some of the videos on my channel aren't actually my videos. I've posted some videos with permission. My videos are the ones like this. You can have them. I made them for you. They're yours. Again, good videos can be reposted on new channels. Some of my classic videos need to be re-recorded because I have way better equipment now than I had 10 years ago. If you're still worried about me deleting my channel, just keep two things in mind. One, every reason you're thinking of right now for why I shouldn't delete my channel, I've thought of it already. And two, every reason you're thinking of right now for why I shouldn't delete my channel, that's what YouTube uses to keep you under their control. They know what's important to people and they use that to control us. If I have to burn my channel to the ground to break their control over us, then call me the human torch. As a final thought, I have to say, I really don't understand why some people get scared in these situations. Do you really think we can't beat these losers? Are they unbeatable? 15 years ago, jihadis told me that they couldn't be stopped. All you had to do was look at their rate of growth and their victory was inevitable mostly due to high birth rates. Their triumph was mathematically certain and only a few decades away. Here we are just 15 years later and everyone is hammering away at the foundations of their jihadist ideology. Everyone knows their weaknesses and all their popular leaders from 15 years ago have been replaced by narcissists who can't get along with each other. What are they moaning and wailing about now? An avalanche. How's that inevitable victory looking now? So, YouTube holds no terrors for us. We deal with jihadis. I'll get everything going. I'll tell everyone when everything is set up. I'll give you a little bit of time to check out the new format. And then we'll have a delete my channel party live where we'll see what happens when I try to delete my channel while I'm live streaming on my channel. If I click delete my channel while I'm live streaming, will the live stream suddenly go dark? Or will YouTube tell me that I can't delete my channel while I'm live? Only one way to find out. Now that you've seen the reasons why David deleted his content, Click here for further explanation from David, or click here to watch his epic final live stream.